to ask you, I don't know if anybody else is having this issue, but I'm still seeing the first slide on this on your presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. I, that, that's true. I was sort of wondering about that myself. Okay. All right. So thank you. Here we are. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I, uh, I, I, I hate the idea that you guys were denied the uh, slides. I apologize for that. This is the first one in our agenda. And these are the bullets that I was referencing earlier. And um, again, our overall uh, goal is an active discussion. And uh, I, um, I, I, I'm certain we'll achieve that. And here are the pictures uh, that uh, Bonnie wanted to make sure you guys didn't miss. Um, and uh, this is, these are pictures of the, um, of the team that's working on this. And uh, so Bonnie's introduced herself. I've introduced myself. Uh, uh, Dr. Taylor, do you, uh, could you introduce yourself to our coworkers? Um, I'm Lori Taylor. I'm the Digital Humanities Librarian at the George A. Smathers Libraries at the University of Florida. And I'm responsible for the analysis, um, synthesis, and translation of user needs into the technical specifications. So I'll be supporting system usability um, and uh, the documentation and really helping Bonnie out and liaising. All right. And um, I also uh, am happy to introduce uh, Mark, S Mark Sullivan, who's going to be the application engineer for our team. And Mark, if you'd introduce yourself. Absolutely. I'm the coordinator of the digital development and web unit here at the University of Florida. So I support the digital libraries and other sort of technological digital web development that we have here. So I'll be doing most of the programming. Um, I guess I'll be the one getting liaised to partly. But um, so we'll probably be seeing each other a lot on these calls as we start going through mock-ups and looking at different things we can do to fulfill your guys' needs. And thank you. Um, and uh, we were hoping that the just to make sure that uh, to further foster an active communication that you guys um, might take a minute and introduce yourselves and in no particular order uh, if you guys would be willing to say who you are and, and the institution that, that, that you work at. I'm Bonnie Boyan. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Good. And I'm the Bonnie with a Y and I'm at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. Well, welcome. I'm Diana Williams and I'm from UMass Amherst. Welcome. I'm Shannon. I'm Dressy, Tom Sedwinski, and, and I'm from the University of South Florida in Tampa. Welcome, Tom. I'm right. Shannon Tresky, and I'm from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. Well, welcome. Hi, this is John Culshaw and Dylan Wiersma, and we're at Colorado. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. I'm Sandra Reginato. I'm calling from the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. Thank you for joining us. Hi, I'm Lisa Meckel from Syracuse University. Thank you. And the other Lisa, Lisa Patton-Glinski with The Ohio State University. I'm Chris yeah, well, Arnold, University of Utah. And Kathy, are you able to, uh, do, you have a, do you have a microphone? Are you able to, to, to join us verbally? I don't know. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to welcome all of you. Um, if, for, if you do uh, have uh, trouble using um, a microphone or uh, speaking with us, please do uh, engage the chat box and we'll make sure that your comments are heard. Uh, as you guys have gathered, um, we've got a terrific representation of a variety of institutions and, and actually um, a, we have a really nice representation of institutions from the United States and Canada. So uh, I'm really uh, happy uh, to have you join us. I appreciate your time. And your input's going to be really critical to this project. The, uh, as I said, I was going to spend a fair amount of time on orientation today. I'll, I'll keep it as brief as I can. But I want to make sure that we're all on the same page um, and uh, that the communication you've had to date really kind of gets across the idea of what we're working on. Uh, the concepts that we had in coming up with the proposal for this project was that position descriptions are important, but they're only useful if they're maintained, accessible, and organized. Um, our institutions, the University of Florida, uh, your institutions, spend a, a, a amount of time archiving, uh, locating, and, uh, and using uh, these uh, and, and trying to keep them up to date. And I can vouch for the fact that institutions 
uh, will frequently solicit uh, PDs as a way of sharing information about the way that we design positions and the work that's done in libraries. And so the PDs themselves are, are a useful vehicle for sharing information. We, in coming up with our proposal, we assumed that if there was a, a free system that was developed uh, that enhances uh, and makes it easier to manage these documents, uh, that it would make them more useful for institutions, um, or at least easier to use them for institutions. And uh, that if that was coupled with a, a national level uh, digital archive of position descriptions, that if it was easy enough to access, that this would improve the sharing of information about our industry, and that would, that would be useful to our industry. The um, premise is of the whole design, and we need your help to make sure that we um, stay faithful to this. The premise of the design of this project is that if there's institutional level value um, in making it easier to manage position descriptions and other documentation associated with describing people's duties, uh, that it is, it is going to be adopted by institutions. Uh, and if it's adopted by the institution, the result of this, by them all being part of a national level system, the resources can be, uh, have industry level value. And we can use them in a way of um, uh, kind of figuring out how other people are defining work, but we can also use it to determine how uh, positions evolve over time and the work of libraries evolve over time. So the idea that there's an institutional le value versus just something we do to contribute data to a national bank, um, it, it's a key concept. And so we need to make this as usable and as useful as possible for the institutions. Um, just to define the project, uh, I'm, guess, I'm thinking most people are aware of this, but just to make sure, ARL sponsored the development of this system. Uh, they uh, did a call um, uh, to see if it was a viable project to sponsor and felt it was and they have sponsored a, uh, a team at UF to uh, develop it, uh, to solicit input from the ARL institutions and to host it. The University of Florida's proposal was that we would host uh, and archive the data uh, and maintain the system on an ongoing basis. The project timeline is over the course of about a year. They, uh, the, we actually um, got word from ARL the final authorization to begin work at the very end of March. And so we're spending a period of the first couple of months on a planning phase. This call is part of that planning phase. And then we're, uh, after a, uh, annual conference in Anaheim, we're going to start the implementation phase, which will last uh, through the winter. And uh, then we'll do a launch. Um, the planning phase includes uh, an assessment of user needs. That's what's captured in the first of these series of webinars. And then the development of uh, system specifications uh, that we all uh, have a consensus that those will be effective and useful. The implementation phase will be where we actually develop the system and, and the support documentation. There will be beta testing uh, for a select group and their feedback will be evaluated, and then we'll come up with the final system, which um, around uh, midwinter of uh, 2013, we will make it available and uh, communicate and advertise and we'll offer user support, and we'll continue to evaluate uh, and, and solicit feedback. The, uh, after that uh, takes place, the, um, the hope is that there, that the intention is first to create a uh, system that is adopted uh, in, by the institutions, and because it's useful, that they will maintain it and use it to, uh, to, to handle their position descriptions. And by that, it, it'll, the data will stay fresh, and it won't just be a, a shot in time in uh, January of 2013, but as, as the system's adopted and the PDs are maintained, that it will... Um, that it'll be, um, it'll be continue to be refreshed and useful data. So what we're hoping from, from you guys, uh, and you uh, ended up on this webinar by your gracious volunteering, either through the invitation of the director of your library or um, through uh, some other contact, and we're happy to have you. 
what we're hoping your institutions will do is participate in the planning phase, and you're already doing that, in determining what our needs are, uh, in coming up with the system specs, but then also when we come up with a beta system that you guys will help test it, um, identify issues with it, opportunities for improvements, and um, so we'll participate um, through these phases. Um, the, what we're looking to design is a web application uh, that um, where documentation, documents associated with people's job duties are uh, uploaded and that they're updated over time by the institution and that uh, where we also include um, data associate that describes um, and is associated with those descriptions. And, uh, the intention is first to come up with something that is a very simple, uh, intuitive uh, interface. Uh, th our goal is for something that's as easy uh, to uh, use as uh, for the document attachment or submission for that to be as easy as, submit as attaching a document to an email. And then also uh, for uh, the way that you have to interact with the system to be no more complicated than completing an online transaction. Uh, and the, we will use um, metadata and keywords uh, for people to be able to um, search uh, the national level uh, database. And um, the intention is first to have a system that can be customized and branded at the institutional level as makes sense for those institutions. The data and the documents that are submitted will be uh, retained um, securely and uh, we the at UF, uh, we have great experience with that, and um, so these are the key design elements that we're aiming for. Uh, as far as uh, the, uh, the system, our intention is that there will be some standard metadata fields, and these are ones that we've come up with as a preliminary list, and that these will be uh, the documents that uh, the, uh, that this will be the data associated with each uh, document that is submitted. And the, um, the first is uh, the percentage of full-time equivalency, um, the Fair Labor Standards Act status, and I'm glad that we have um, some international or some Canadian institutions joining us so that we can talk about how that makes sense for your institutions. And then also we would collect, um, ask that each position be identified and uh, is potentially, is it a professional librarian position? Is it another professional position? Uh, is it a support or paraprofessional position? Um, what the employment type is? Is it a um, is it a tenure accruing? Is it a time limited? Is it uh, potentially a um, uh, internship? Uh, was an example that has been mentioned. The type of institution, whether it's a law library, a health library, or uh, or the other types of libraries, uh, there may be some dates associated with these that were. Um, that either will automatically collect or will ask people to submit, and then the working title. Um, and the idea is that we may use classifications, uh, but the, the way in which the, the, we establish the working title at, is probably as informative as anything. And then uh, lastly, uh, the idea is that we would collect uh, the job type, uh, and that might be something like a cataloging position or a reference position or a human resources position. And so this is, the, the idea is that these would be standard metadata fields. We want to have enough to where we collect data that makes it easy to find position descriptions that we're interested in, but not so cumbersome that it really becomes a chore for people to submit and maintain. Right. Uh, yes? This is uh, Lisa from OSU. Can you just mention again the difference between um, position type and employment type? Can you just say that one more time? Sure. The, uh, the idea of a position type would be that uh, it would be uh, a professional librarian, uh, some, and, and then we would define that uh, probably as a, a position that requires an, an MLS degree or the equivalent, um, or uh, some other professional, which might include, um, I, I might think we might have a web designer um, that might fall into that other level of professional position and then um, support or paraprofessional uh, positions. Okay. And then it would be up to the institution itself to identify at what level does um, a, uh, a 
a paraprofessional position transcend to a professional position. And at the University of Florida, for example, uh, not to get too far in the weeds, though I love to get into the weeds, um, one of the things that we would have to determine institutionally is uh, we have library assistant one, two, three, and then our, uh, our salaried positions are library associate one, two, three. We have very few as a percentage of those positions, very few of them are associate threes. And I think one of the things that we would need to establish here as, in, in using this is whether those positions are, um, those hit the threshold of a professional position. Um, so that probably answered your question and yeah. even more, even more yeah. than you wanted. No, 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 that was good. And then the employment type is, you know, whether it's um, a, a faculty type position versus a staff position versus clerical or civil service. That's yeah, I, I think so. The um, you know whether it's a tenure or permanent status accruing, whether it's a uh, whether it's a regular appointment, but I would think certainly we would want to use that in some way to differentiate if we do collect descriptions for internships or um, residents or something like that, which has been proposed. That would be the way in which we would categorize those differently. Okay. Mm -hmm. Brian, it's Kathleen here. Um, I was trying to uh, join you earlier, but my microphone wasn't working. We can hear you perfectly now. Good, or great, thank you. Um, um, could I just ask a, a question then? Um, are, are we focusing on librarian positions at first, or what, what will be our focus? I had thought that it was professional positions, but um, it's, uh, it looks like it's expanded to me, or perhaps I hadn't realized that earlier. Well, I think the, the intention at UF had always been that it would be, um, that, it, the, that it would be all sorts of positions. My thought is that the institutions themselves will be able to use uh, the system, you know, to the extent that it makes sense. Um, and uh, so at UF, I think that there's a, we definitely will use it for staff employees. We um, are likely to also use it for our, um, our librarians. And one of the questions I want to talk about uh, l later, and, and I don't want to s skip ahead to Bonnie's part, but one of the things we're going to talk about later is um, whether we actually have position descriptions for librarians. And the impression that we have from the discussions we've had mm -hmm. to date is that there are, there are commonly, though not universally, position descriptions for staff employees. And in many instances, there are, there's less maintained documentation associated with librarians. And, and if there is, then the, even if there is maintained documentation, we're, we have heard that um, in many instances, they're more along the lines of an annual assignment versus an updated position description that's updated annually. So, so, to, answer, so, so to continue to to answer the question asked and then a whole bunch more. Um, to answer your question, it won't be limited to librarians, but if an institution only wants to use this for staff employees or only wants to use it for librarians, uh, it, it, it'll definitely be possible for them to do that. Did, uh, did I answer your question and then some? Uh, yes, thanks very much. Okay, well those are the standard uh, metadata fields and then the, the idea is to make this useful these, again, the purpose of these is to help us, if I'm interested in whether there's an exhibits coordinator position, I could go in and I could use exhibits as a working title search. And if I got, you know, if I, if I had 50 of these and wanted to narrow it, I could narrow it to only librarian positions or only prof other professionals. Um, so the idea is that this allows this to be functional on a national level. To make it as useful as possible, on, a, in, on an institutional level, there would also be a series of fields that are only viewable at our own institutions. And if I chose to, if it was important for me, I could, I could populate data associated with the employee's name, uh, the supervisor's name if it helped me organize them, position numbers, the department or branch or some other unit uh, that it works in. Uh, that it could retain the data it was reviewed and modified so I could maintain it for scheduling purposes. Um, and then I also would have a field where I could put notes that would only be seen at our institutional level. Um, those were ones that we presumed, and there may be others that we would go ahead and pre, 
establishes standards that can be selected from. And then there would also be an opportunity for, um, uh, for our institutions to identify some other customizable alphanumeric fields that we could elect to use if we wanted to. And those would be ones that would make sense for us. And you know, we might establish the opportunity to have up to 10 of these or some number. And that would, again, maximize the utility of this on the institutional level. Again, this is, it, and, and for instance, I think it's likely that some institutions would include some fashion of salary information in here. I don't think we would do that at the University of Florida, but regardless of whether the institution opted to do that, the inf information would not be viewable outside of their institution. Uh, the features that we anticipate is that the, uh, that might be improvements over some of the systems that we currently use. Uh, would be that this would not only maintain the current uh, position description, but it would also be able to, to track and access previous versions of PDs in case that was useful. And then uh, and, and that we would also um, be able to um, use this on the institutional level to establish review schedules, and we would also be able to run internal only reports that are limited to our institution. One of the things I think is interesting about the having archives is that if a position were to become vacant, um, it would also allow us to maintain um, that position description that was vacated. Uh, and so that's in th those are the ideas. Of really starting from a from the concept of where did this idea come from, to some of the particulars of the system, uh, to make sure we're all on the same page. I don't know if you guys have any questions about that before we get into a more. Um, targeted discussion of, of some of the elements that we've discussed. Um, but if you have any questions before I hand the baton off to, um, to Bonnie, I'm happy to, to, to try and address them. Nope, sounds good. Okay. Well, I'm going to pass it on to Bonnie, and I'll still be on the line. Um, so, Bonnie, it should be passing the baton to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to maximize this so everybody sees my screen. Just making sure, um, can you see uh, the screen that says today's discussion? Yeah. yeah. Right. All right, thank you very much. So what we, um, the real purpose of this um, is really in the discussion and finding out from you what your practices are and what your needs are um, and your ideas on what would be useful in terms of uh, the categories or the features of uh, this uh, database, this PD bank. So the first question is uh, for us to gather this information is to find out from you what types of documents you currently use for position descriptions. And perhaps um, I know that in webinars a lot of times people are shy to talk, but we're hoping that people will chime in and there's the chat box in case um, you don't have the ability to speak on a speaker. And I will be happy to read those. Um, and answer those, so I'm following that closely as well. So we're hoping that you will um, contribute at this point. I could start, Bonnie. Uh, this is Sandra from the University of Guelph, Thank Ontario, you. Canada. So we have um, basically two position descriptions. One, one format is very formally used, and that's for um, all positions that are not librarian in nature. So these are professional positions, paraprofessional positions, and support positions. And um, these um, are university-wide, uh, widely used. And they're, they're used be, in essence because each position um, needs to be evaluated. And then based on that evaluation, they're compensated. So, uh, so that we ensure we have equity uh, across the university. Um, so that's, that's one. And then the other is more informal in nature, and it's for our librarian positions that are, and they're, so the other ones are updated, kept up to date, and, and need to be updated, are supposed to be updated every <laughs> five years. Okay. I'm not sure they are. Right. Um, for the librarians, we basically write a position description uh, encompassing all of the duties of, of the position. And we are a tripartite um, library, so each librarian has um, the requirement of scholarship, professional practice, and service within okay. their 
position. Um, so all of that is is written and written when we recruit for our librarian, and then it's really not updated unless we have a reorganization of of our structure, and then they would be updated. But they're not uh, maintained really. Okay, that Nor sounds. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. That sounds, in terms of the librarians, that sounds similar to what we've heard at other institutions where um, what we call that um, at the University of Florida is we call it a position vacancy announcement. So uh, really a position description is um, written at the time when the position is vacant and it's posted and that's what um, applicants um, apply to uh, that position. But then after that point, that official document, if you will, um, as the duties change in that librarian's position, it's not really updated. So we also have that same um, situation here. Are there others who have different scenarios? Our is uh, relatively similar as well. Um, with the, especially for us, it's, it's faculty. The librarian positions are faculty. And um, you know, the initial advertisements are written. Not necessarily updated. I think that um, typically what they try to do if there are changes to the position, they try to handle those through the um, annual evalu evaluation period and try to document things through that. Um, we are trying to take our position descriptions for the librarians as well as you know the initial advertisements that we do. We are trying to update those in current times. You know, in the past, very. Um, these are the things you're responsible for. What we're trying to actually do a little bit more of these days, um, make them a little bit more outcomes oriented, okay. and you know, following more of that um, kind of performance based. Okay. So making a, a few changes. Um, similar on the um, the staff side, although again they are becoming much more uh, performance oriented based. But typically, um, they would have uh, some similar things uh, throughout the university. And then we try to make them vary for equity and compensation. You know, we're kind of matching with other position titles for, say, human resources generalist or office associate or you know, things of that nature. Um, you know, similar to what you would see in other parts of the university as a whole. Right. And I have, um, well, thank you for that. And I have a, a chat here that uh, Lisa Mokel, who says that we have a wide variety of documents. Typically, when a position has come vacant, we draft a new job posting, which lists the duties and expectations. But often, a formal job description has not been created or updated at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and sh Lisa, can you speak for yourself, or I'm reading these? I okay. can. I just was concerned about the feedback, so let me know if I'm. Oh no, you're good. That... When you're talking, okay. it's fine. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I don't. Can everybody see what I wrote in the chat? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I don't need to repeat myself. Uh, I'll just repeat it because we're recording. Okay. So it just says I have been tasked with creating a standardized job description template. Interesting for all librarians to be implemented this summer. That's very interesting. So. What I'm gathering, and I'll allow more time for others to um, chime in, but I'm gather gathering, as with the other um, meeting that we had, webinar that we had, that um, we will probably need to extend um, this database to include uh, maybe job ads, so position vacancy announcements, job ads, and also other types of documents would probably be, be useful to be able to upload those. And um, I'll open the mic again just so people can, others can contribute. I, I would, yeah, I would uh, like. Oh, go ahead. Winsky, University of South Florida. Um, I like the idea of adding position vacancy announcements because those, of course, very often are really the basis for what becomes the uh, position description. And I think here in South Florida, as most of you have already said, our professional faculty positions, they we do, really don't maintain um, uh, position descriptions. Uh, very, very well, I think. You know, once the, the, the vacancy announcement goes out, that pretty much becomes the position description. Now, for our staff, there are the usual procedures that you have to follow to post a position. And it's, it's, it's very um, time-consuming, I think, for us 
to get get people to maintain those uh, position descriptions. And along with that, our evaluation process has become a lot more performance oriented and more future uh, uh, looking for the way positions are going to change. And um, what we try to do is to blend both the existing position description and those performance uh, evaluations uh, on a more regular basis. Uh, but it's, 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 it's not easy. Uh, people, there's a reluctance to do that. And, and having a database like this would help. That's right. And I'm th I think that um, one of our thoughts was that this database might actually help institutions um, with that process of updating so that you could put a position description in the system and say this needs to be updated in a, at a certain date and then you would get a message or there would be something that would alert you to the fact that a whole group of position descriptions need to be updated at this time. And you could also go in and run uh, reports based on when they were last updated, those types of things. So hopefully this will help us automate some of that, um, those you know, tasks that we think would be helpful but we don't have in place yet. And, and one of the things that I think is really interesting about Lisa's comment that they're going to standardize job descriptions for librarians, uh, this is Brian at the University of Florida. One of the things that's occurred to me as we've been thinking about this is if we had the features of this system, I don't know if we would do full job descriptions of that, to the extent that we have for staff employees, which are include a lot of things about lifting and what sort of equipment they use. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I was thinking that we might come, um, come up with something that was a, a much shorter document, but you know, full of bullets. So it included a lot of the information associated with the librarian's primary professional responsibilities, and that we would, um, and that we might use the the ability to see how when the last time these were updated, and have and see if we couldn't get them updated every two years or or something and get our faculty to buy into that um, so that we could maintain these documents and and uh, just as part of our you know contribution to the industry but also just for us so that we would have them to reference. This is Lisa at Syracuse again and I just wanted to elaborate a little bit more um, on one of one of the reasons why we want to standardize these just to a certain extent is that um, our subject specialists you know, a couple years ago did, uh, as a unit, they all updated their job descriptions, but what they came up with were about six page long, very detailed, <laughs> really more descriptions of their assignments than a more you know, generalized job descriptions. So we're trying to make that distinction and make the job descriptions more apl applicable across broader categories. Sure. It's well, I'm... Shannon Trust. Hello? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, it's Shannon Tresky from Queens, and I would say that we are very similar uh, to Guelph in that our uh, support staff or staff positions are fairly up to date for evaluation purposes, but our librarian ones um, tend to be similar to the other groups in that they get created when a new position is created, but they kind of get left after that. So we have some that are very old and some that are fairly recent and we're trying to do the same thing to make them fairly generic so that um, a reference librarian position can be very similar across five different people and maybe just have a few pieces that can be brought in that are specific to the role so that's sort of where we are right now. Great well it sounds like there's some similarities um, and some good ideas that have come out of this discussion. What I wanted to do is I wanted to move on to the next question which, which will um, automatically continue the same kind of discussion as to, okay, we have all these documents and how is it that you are managing these documents? What are some of the ways um, that they're being managed in your institution? Well, this is Bonnie at Washington State and um, like the others, um, we use people, administ people admin, uh, which I think a lot of institutions use for the staff and AP positions. Uh, it's required by HRS. We really have very little flexibility on what we can provide, how we do them. They have to be done a certain way. Um, and they all require that percentage, breakdown of percentage of duties, which I think is critical in the staff and AP positions, whereas our faculty positions do not typically have any percentages. They have more like, I think somebody mentioned like a bulleted list of some things they probably would cover, um, but we don't have percentages attached to that and the librarians have 
they don't want that. Uh, they need that flexibility. And I also notice that our, our HR department university-wide has much less interest in the faculty positions. We're kind of allowed total autonomy with that. Um, they do see them when there is a vacancy, uh, and they are reviewed at that time, but that's the only time they see them as far as I know. Um, but I think we've done a pretty good job of, of managing them by updating at the annual review. They don't always get updated every year, but I know they are reviewed and I frequently will see them updated right at the time of annual review each year. So some differences. So from OSU, it's um, uh, handled the same way uh, for us as Bonnie was talking about. And we also use uh, PeopleSoft or PeopleAdmin as well. Almost an identical process to what you talked about. And we, we also do believe there is a, a system in place where, especially on the staff ones, they do, you know, formally we ask our supervisors to update those at performance appraisal time. And then with the faculty, we, we have our supervisors of faculty talking to them annually when they're doing their annual review about any specific changes to expectations for the position. So very similar. Okay, Kathleen thank you. Here. Um, we, we don't use the PeopleSoft, uh, what is it called, People Admin part here at the U of A, although we are using other PeopleSoft uh, modules, I guess. Uh, and so what we have been doing is scoping out, uh, putting up um, our position descriptions on a you know, secure server where our super can access them. Um, but I'm certainly interested in this project because I mean, obviously, the you know the advantages of sharing and seeing what other people are are doing are there. Um, our position descriptions, I would say, well, on the the support staff side, are I would say very up to date, um, and we've written a lot of benchmarks so that if one position um, you know in a group changes, then automatically others others change too. Um, our librarian positions, again, I would say are fairly up to date. All of our positions have to go to a position review committee on recruitment. Um, but then after that, we do um, update them, um, uh, you know, if, if need be. And again, we, we did do a lot of kind of standardized description uh, several years ago. So if, for example, we have a public services librarian position, um, change, then it can, you know, the other, the other librarians in the system can be looked at as well. So that's, that's where we are and that's what, we're, what we've been thinking about using in order to uh, provide better access to position descriptions, you know, rather than in a, in a binder in, in someone's office. Sure, making them available yeah. to managers and uh, other people in the department is, is, I think, is an interesting concept as well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is Diana at UMass Amherst, and I'm listening to everybody, and our process is very different, and it's probably because our librarians are not faculty. Um, we have certain forms that we are required to use. The forms were bargained over depending on which, if they're a staff member, a professional, or a librarian, and we're similar in the respect that at annual review time, um, supervisors and the staff members are expected to review um, their job descriptions and see if they've um, changed, if they need to be updated. Um, but everybody has a job description. Um, and if we had a vacancy, for example, we would start off by writing a job description, not a posting. Um, so it's a little bit different um, from, from the rest of you. OK, but that's useful because your um, feedback will be helpful. The different We need to make sure that this um, serve the needs of all different institutions and um, yeah so I think that's good and let me um, Brian did you want to add anything at this point well the only thing I would add is uh, if if there's anyone that's a participant in this uh, webinar uh, that feels that the system that you are using either by and large or has some features that are are really very good or extremely useful one of the things we're going to ask at the end of this is that you follow up with us uh, if, if any ideas occur to you after the session uh, that you send an email to us. But if you're from an institution where you, where you have a system that is either has elements or overall is excellent or very good, if you would follow up with us and, and let us know that because um, we're, we, we would really like to understand um, and, to, to, and to 
consider those features in incorporating them into this system. Okay. So if we move to the next slide, what we're going to do is we're going to look over again those um, categories that we talked about earlier that Brian went over and ask that you think whether there are things that are missing from this list that would be useful. Again, the position type would be the ones that you know we had thought about was professional librarian, other professionals, support staff. Um, so the, the, that would be the uh, position type. Under employment type, it might be tenure accruing or uh, permanent status eligible, temporary. Perhaps there would be um, some for, gosh, I don't know. There was somebody who had suggested something in the last webinar. Brian, do you remember? I believe it was residents or interns. Right, residents or interns. So that would be what the employment type would include. So just wondering if you had comments on this, uh, on these categories. And again, the purpose for these. This is what's that? The purpose for this data is, is allowing us really outside of the institution to be able to access all of this data in a way to where we can narrow it down and find documents that we might be interested. So it's got kind of that dual purpose. Brian, Brian what about uh, compensation? This is at Syracuse. I'm, I'm well, sorry. Tom, was Brian, yeah, this is Tom Stewinsky. Have you considered compensation, you know, salary structures? Well, I'm, you know, my cons we certainly have considered the idea that people would want to use this on the institutional level, um, that it would be useful there, uh, that they also might want to track, you know, that these are employees that belong to this union or that are on this campus or those sorts of things. But our thought was that a lot of that uh, either would would people would be sensitive to or they would um, it would be so it would vary so much from institution to institution that it would be uh, that it would be really you know it would be we wouldn't collect it on the on the kind of global level that those would right. be fields that could be used on the institutional level but I'm, I'm happy to hear wh why we should, if we should reconsider that well I think um, I mean, from time to time, as we post positions, I, I sort of wonder what other institutions are, are, are frankly, paying people for those kinds of skills. Uh, for an example, there's a discussion just recently. I, I, don't, I don't remember if it's a LAMA group or an ACRL group about a GIS position. And, um, you know, the salary structure for, for GIS positions seems to be all over the place. And, uh, I mean, if we were, we were going to move forward with a GIS librarian, I would I would be very interested in knowing what some comparable institutions uh, are paying for that kind of a skill. I don't disagree. I don't know if other people feel the same way. I don't disagree with you uh, that, that that would be useful. I'm I'm not uh, certain that this is the is a effective vehicle for that. Right. But I, but I'm happy to hear from other folks. I'm not I think sure. the compensation piece is hard to capture and be useful for other people only because of um, where people live yeah. um, and the, the cost of living varies so dramatically. You know, we're out in the western part of Massachusetts and we vary dramatically just within Massachusetts versus, say, a library that's out in the Boston area. So to try and compare somebody who might be, you know, in South Dakota is even more challenging. Um, I get what Tom's trying to say. You know, you want to know for that specific skill set, which GIS is, you know, hard to attract. What is um, a compatible price? You know, what what are the skills? You know, um, being paid for elsewhere. But you have to remember the demographics. So I'm not sure if it's useful for the overall I project. But if we were able to do a search and limit the geography, like, you know, for instance, I would be looking at, at institutions in the southeast. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just thought I'd throw it out. I, I can tell you one way I think this might approach that is recently we, um, we were looking at exhibit, an exhibits coordinator position. And by the ability to keyword search the working title exhibits, um, uh, you know, I would be able to narrow it down. It to and, and it would, you know, presumably it would the, 
though we haven't designed the system, it would say exhibits coordinator UNC Chapel Hill, exhibits coordinator Chicago. And, um, and I could, you know, through my connections, and maybe even we could make it easier and, and have it where people that participate in this can send each other, you know, that, that, that they'll have access to contacts. I mean, maybe if I did a GI, if, if this is truly adopted by our industry, and, and it would only be useful if it is, uh, as far as the salary information anyway, if I did a search on GIS and it came up on, at seven institutions, and then I narrowed it, and okay, well, there's only three of those that are librarians, I could send an email to those three institutions, and then I could work backwards why I don't consider the, um, the ones from California to be applicable to Florida, but I consider the ones from Georgia to be okay. So right. maybe, just, maybe just by allowing us to orient ourselves to these unique sorts of positions, um, it, it would be a useful tool in that way. Good. Yeah, it's true. This is uh, Lisa from OSU. I, I do agree with Tom that there is some definite value in just getting a general ballpark of, especially with some of the emerging positions that you don't necessarily have a whole lot of history or it isn't necessarily called out in the ARL uh, salary statistics. It, it's helpful to even just get a, a ballpark to understand or some competitive information to understand. I think where, a, at least with the metadata that's listed, where I think things can get a little tricky, especially if you're talking about you know, GIS or say that you were creating a position that was uh, digital initiatives or things of that nature. Um, I think people define those so differently. There isn't necessarily, um, you know, anything that you can easily glean as to, um, you know, what level is that position? Could you have one that's more of an entry level and they're looking at certain parts of digital initiatives and, you know, another one that's second in command to your, you know, AD of IT. I think that's more of where some of the salary comparisons get a little bit tricky, is if you don't necessarily know the content or um, the level of responsibility or, you know, this might be, this digital initiatives person might be a real heavy hitter with, you know, six or seven faculty reporting to them and this particular level of responsibility versus entry level. You know, I think with some of the geography, you know, we probably kind of know that, you know, something on, you know, the East Coast or the West Coast or something might be a little bit more. Um, and you might be able to make some accommodation. But that, as far as the level of position, I think that gets a little bit tough. Right. And I think this is a really useful conversation. And, and we'll have opportunities for more input. And I hope that you will uh, take the opportunity to uh, write to us and give us your input for those of you who haven't had a chance to contribute on this slide. But I'm feeling um, that I need to move on because we only have um, eight precious minutes left to this um, to gather your thoughts in this format in any case. And so I'd like to move to the next uh, slide, which is about the job types. These are the job types that we um, have generally put together for those presentations that we could think of. And we really welcome your uh, thoughts on what might be missing. Also, maybe where there might be some overlap or how, how things look at your institution and whether these would fit into the um, job types that you might have. I'm going to give you, I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to give you a minute uh, just to scan them over. And then uh, perhaps people could uh, contribute. Can I just ask one quick question before we move to this, Bonnie? Sure. Um, it's Sandra calling from University of Guelph. What is the FLSA? Oh, excellent Fair question. Labor Standards Act? Oh, that's that a great question. <laughs> and that is definitely something that we're going to need, um, the, need your help in converting that. Um, the Fair Labor Standards Act is, uh, the, is the law in the United States that differentiates between uh, Ex non-exempt from overtime and exempt from overtime, and those the, the more common the more common term that most people would use in the United States for those would be hourly versus salaried, and um, those are two broad categories of employment, and the idea is that that might be that would be useful for us to just on a hugely macro level differentiate between the types of positions that we're looking at. And I don't know if the use of the term hourly versus salary makes sense 
uh, for Canada. I should know that, but I don't. So could you guys give us some advice on that? It's, it's not when, when we're talking about uh, overtime versus non-overtime paid uh, employees. In, in Canada or Ontario, at least, it's the Employment Standards Act. And it depends on the nature of your position, so management or professional position, but more manager, managerial or supervisory positions do not earn overtime or not. Um, and then non-managerial positions are eligible for overtime. But you could be a regular full-time person and normally your salary, but that doesn't mean that you do not earn overtime. And that's really the distinction here. I mean, I can pay people who work less than 40 hours a week a set amount of time, but the distinction is whether they're, they're – and so the use of salary is not a perfect term for exempt, though it's commonly used. So if we were to use overtime eligible um, or overtime ineligible, that would, that would, that, that would capture ca Canadian uh, workplaces too? Well, it depends upon the yeah. province and the Employment Standards Act. Yeah. So I don't know that that's a distinction that really, sorry, it's Kathleen, that really um, is one that we commonly use. I, I guess my question would be whether or not that has to be a, uh, you know, a mandatory field. Right. I think we could make it an optional field that way. Um, right. If it's not because applicable. that way, yeah, you could use it if you wished, but we don't have to kind of try to put in something that might not work entirely for Canadian positions. I think it's also possible we could just remove that. Yeah, I'm not sure why were you going to include it. Uh, just because it is a major categorization um, that would allow people. But given the other stuff, position type and employment type, you know, I think it may just be redundant. And as far as getting people to adopt this system, if we can remove a field, I think that's probably a good thing for us to do. Yeah, simple is good. Yeah, Kathleen here again. Sorry, I've, I've just been scanning quickly and I might have missed it. Do we ask whether positions are temporary or permanent anywhere? It would be in the um, employment type. Uh, okay, that, good. Yeah, because that, that would be something that would, um, you know, that I would certainly like to know. Okay, so thank you very much for that um, side, side street there that we went on. But um, if we could now look back at these um, job types and if anybody would like to comment um, or add their... And did you say the job types said. are taken from the, um, the ARA, the A, sorry, the ARL um, categories? These are largely borrowed from ARL, but they're also, um, they represent some of the, uh, they, they address some of the lack of granularity that we you know, we've yeah, observed. yeah, that's what I was thinking as I looked at them. I, I mean, I have no problem with that because I've never been a fan of the ARL categories. <laughs> so um, I guess the, um, you know, the thing would be that it would be uh, useful just to be able to suggest new things as they come up because that's part of the problem is that if you've got a system that's too rigid, then you're always trying to, to shoehorn positions into it. So I agree with that. Some kind of controlled vocabulary that that did evolve, I think that would be, um, that, fle that flexibility would be very much appreciated. I also, um, this is Lisa at Syracuse, um, wondering about the ability to perhaps choose multiple job types. Um, I think there are other folks out there like me who actually have three separate but somewhat related job responsibilities, so I would not fall into any of these categories. Um, and we have other folks who are sort of wearing multiple hats like that, so I don't know if you've thought about we heard that loud and clear um, in the previous session that we did, and so it will be possible for people to select multiple um, options. Does, does anyone note any um, areas that are, that are omitted? And we should point out that you guys will receive, you'll have access to the slides after the meeting, and so if any occur to you later, you, you know, when you have a chance to look at this. But if any omissions are noted, if you would, please let us know. Hi, this is Dylan from uh, CU. Uh, not seen a lot of management level things like dean or director or branch head on that list. That was my thought as well. Like any of the administrative team or leadership team, a lot of times we would characterize those in with um, administration. 
Okay. That's a good point. Yeah. So if there was, you know, library management. Sure. Ab absolutely. Sounds good. Would I, circulation uh, fall under public services? Uh, presumably it would. Um, on this list, unless it's added as a subcategory. Um, There's also access support, I see. I'm not sure how that's being defined, but access often includes circulation. Okay. Uh, and see, we would have said public services. Yeah. So isn't that interesting? See, we, you know how we all categorize them a little differently. Right. So it would help. If we do have job types, it would help to have a descriptor so that we're able to search a little better. Yeah, I think that's an excellent um, um, comment. And uh, we really uh, welcome your input. And there will be an email address for you to contact us as you look at these and um, think some more on uh, what categories would be helpful, what job types would be helpful. Please do communicate them with us. Um, in terms of the, the features, did somebody want to say something? In terms of the features, um, we were thinking that we would archive and access, have archive capability and access to previous versions of the position descriptions. And um, this could help accommodating, maintaining, um, you know, so that if you had a vacancy, you could uh, use the previous version to update it. So, and also, um, this would support the establishment of review schedules. This, we talked about this a little earlier on, uh, where you would be able to um, put a schedule in there for review. And would also, one of the features would be a, a very strong reporting feature on uh, the different areas that we were talking about. So just wanted to know if anybody had. And I realized that it is now 3 o'clock. And uh, uh, we are wrapping up. Uh, this so if you have some ideas on this and you're able to spend a couple of minutes that would be helpful. I have a question on the reporting. Is it possible uh, for this system to take um, the positions for each of the libraries, each of the institutions, and show sort of an org chart. So many times, you know, we'll be reviewing one area or another. For instance, we're reviewing our user services, which encompasses everything from circulation, document delivery, to writing services, and so on. And it's often helpful to see how others are structured to give you ideas and sort of brainstorm. So is that one of the reports? I, could be written. Right. I think that, um, oh boy, I, I think we might find it useful, but um, if maintaining an org chart um, in our institution alone is um, what are difficult the, to do. I Go ahead, Brian. One of, the, uh, one, of the things, one of the things that uh, we've uh, agreed with ARL that we'll do is that um, we'll First of all, we'll develop this system and, and, um, and work towards as universal of an adoption of the system as, as the institutions are willing to do. Um, but that we would also make recommendations um, to, um, to, to ARL about what the next step, what improvements beyond you know, what this project is. And that has come up before, and I think it's likely one that um, would be recommended um, that, that that feature, uh, but the uh, so so that's a great idea. Uh, what I do think that we can do, though, it won't necessarily allow you to see how other places are organized, but what it might allow you to do is um, what we might be able. What, what I would assume that we would do is have multiple levels of unit. So mm -hmm. at the at, at UF we have a division level, and certainly in the self-defined. So like at UF we could have collections and branches, and beneath that we could have the branch name, and even beneath that we could have um, the units within branches. And so it would be possible for me to run a report for all of the collections and branches, for only the uh, what we would deem departmental libraries, or only these two libraries, or only this one library, and, and maybe all of them, but just the circulation units. 
So we would be to the level that we're willing to, to on an institutional level, populate and maintain that data. It would allow us to, to refine uh, our query results. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Thank you. Kathleen here. I'm sorry, I've got to go. Okay, thank you very much, Kathleen. Uh, very good conversation. Thank you. Okay, and we'll continue. So. Yes, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. I think that um, in terms of what other things um, can you think of, and maybe there's things that are missing. I'm sure there are. Um, if, you, if things occur to you uh, that you think should be included or shouldn't be included, we would uh, really like to hear from you for the sake of time. I'm going to um, provide you with uh, the email address. You can also email me directly, and you have received emails from me as well as from this email address. Um, and we will be circulating tomorrow. I will send you a copy of the recording and also of the slide so you will have that information. And please do be in touch and thank you so much for your participation in this process. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.